All right, welcome. In this review, we're going to take a deep dive into the foundational principles of orthopedic screw fixation. We'll cover everything from the basic screw anatomy and biomechanics, all the way to specific surgical techniques and some of the more advanced implant technologies out there. So let's start with the absolute basics. What is a screw, biomechanically speaking? Well, you can think of it as an inclined plane that's been wrapped around a core. Its entire function is to take the rotational force we apply, the torque, and convert it into linear motion. That's what drives the implant into bone and what allows us to generate either compression or just pure fixation. So first things first, let's deconstruct the screw into its fundamental components. You know, having a really precise understanding of its anatomy is absolutely essential if we're going to apply it correctly in osteosynthesis. When you look at it, pretty much every orthopedic screw we use can be broken down into these four essential parts. You've got the head, the shaft, the thread, and the tip. Each one has a very distinct function and, as we'll see, design variations that are tailored for very specific clinical scenarios. The screw head, of course, is where your screwdriver goes, and it's what provides that final hard stop when you're inserting it. But the real game changer here, the most significant evolution, has been the introduction of threaded heads for locking plate systems. This is huge because it creates a fixed angle construct, essentially locking the screw to the plate. This gives us superior angular stability, which is absolutely critical in things like osteoporotic bone or really comminuted fractures, where it prevents the screw from toggling and you losing your reduction. Okay, let's move down from the head to the shaft. Now, in certain screws, like a partially threaded cancella screw, the shaft is that smooth, unthreaded part between the head and the threads. And this specific geometry brings us to a really critical transition zone. This concept of the runout is absolutely crucial to understand. This transition point is, biomechanically speaking, the weakest point of the entire screw. It's where you have the highest stress riser. So, what does this mean for us in the OR? Well, if your pilot hole is off-center, or you drill it so it's not perfectly perpendicular to the plate, you concentrate all the cyclical loading forces right at this spot, and that can lead to fatigue and eventually implant failure. All right, the thread. This is where the magic happens, right? This is the part of the screw that actually engages the bone. Its geometric profile isn't random. It's very precisely engineered to optimize the purchase and the fixation within different types of bone. You can really see a key evolution in thread design right here. The older V-thread profiles with those sharp corners actually created significant stress risers right at the bone implant interface. The modern buttress thread, on the other hand, has these rounded corners. This design distributes stress much more evenly, which reduces the risk of microfractures and really enhances the long-term stability of our fixation. Okay, so we've got the anatomy down. Now let's see how all those parts translate into the biomechanical principles that really guide our screw selection for different bone qualities and different fracture patterns. Pitch is simply the distance from one thread to the next. And here's the key relationship to remember. It's an inverse relationship between pitch and bone density. So for dense cortical bone, we use cortical screws with a very fine or small pitch. This lets us pack more threads into that dense bone to maximize our purchase. On the flip side, cancellous screws have a coarse or large pitch, which allows those wider threads to get a much more substantial grip in that porous trabecular bone. Okay, this is a point that can trip people up, so let's be really clear. The core diameter, that solid cross-section of the screw, is what dictates the screw's own intrinsic strength and its resistance to fatigue failure. That's why our pilot drill bit has to match that core diameter. Pull-out strength, on the other hand, isn't about the core. It's a function of the threads, specifically the outer thread diameter and how deep those threads are engaged in the bone. So all of this naturally leads us to the two main families of screws we use every day. It's the fundamental division in screw design, and it's a direct result of the biomechanics we've just been talking about. Screws made for dense diphyseal bone versus those made for the softer metaphyseal and epiphyseal bone. This table lays it all out perfectly, and you can see how every design feature is just a logical consequence of the bone it's meant for. The easiest way to think about it is this. A cortical screw is basically a machine screw. It's got that fine pitch and a large core diameter to give it strength and dense material. A cancellous screw is much more like a wood screw. It uses those coarse, deep threads and a smaller core to outer diameter ratio to just maximize its grip in less dense, spongy bone. All right, let's switch gears from screw design to screw application. We have to talk about the lag screw principle. This is fundamental to fracture fixation. It's how we use a standard screw to generate that beautiful interfragmentary compression right across a fracture line. So how do we do it? 
the key, the absolute key, is creating a gliding hole in the near cortex. We do this by overdrilling with a bit that's equal to the screw's outer thread diameter. Then, the far cortex gets the standard pilot hole, matching the core diameter. What this does is ensure the screw threads only purchase in that far fragment. So as we tighten the screw, its head engages the near cortex and mechanically pulls the two fragments together, compressing the fracture to promote primary bone healing. Now there's an easier way to get this same effect, and that's by using a screw that's literally designed for it from the get-go. Most commonly, that's going to be a partially threaded cancellous screw. With this design, you don't have to overdrill. Why? Because the smooth shaft is the gliding hole. It's built right in. As the distal threads cross the fracture line and start to purchase in the far fragment, tightening the screw brings the head down onto the near cortex, and voila, you get compression. It's a highly efficient technique, especially in those metaphyseal fractures. Okay, to round things out, let's just touch on a few of the more specialized screw designs that you'll encounter. These have been developed to tackle very specific and often very challenging clinical problems. So think about an intraarticular fracture, like in the scaphoid or the radial head. The absolute last thing you want is a prominent screw head causing impingement or damaging cartilage. Headless screws are designed to solve this exact problem. They provide compression while being completely buried beneath the articular surface. The genius here is the differential pitch. The threads at the tip, the distal threads, have a greater pitch than the threads near the top. What does that mean? It means for every single rotation, the tip of the screw advances further into the bone than the proximal end is drawn in. This difference in advancement is what generates really powerful interfragmentary compression. It's a truly elegant solution, and it's why these screws are ideal for things like scaphoid fractures and small joint fusions. Now, let's talk about something that's still very much an evolving field, bioabsorbable screws. These are typically made of polymers that are resorbed by the body over time, which, in theory, means we don't have to go back in to remove the implant later. When you look at these, you can see there's a real clinical trade-off we have to make. The advantages are compelling, right? MRI compatibility, no second surgery for removal, that's all great. But you have to balance that against some pretty significant disadvantages. They have lower initial strength, there's a potential for sterile inflammatory reactions, and their absorption rates can be pretty variable. This is still an area of very active research. So to wrap up, if there's one core biomechanical principle to take away from all of this, let it be this one. When you're evaluating any screw construct and thinking about its fatigue life, just remember that its ultimate resistance to cyclical loading and failure is determined first and foremost by its core diameter. And that really leaves us with a fascinating question for the future. You know, we've pretty much mastered the mechanics of our standard metallic implants, but the future of osteosynthesis might not just be about mechanics. It might lie in these bio-integrative materials that don't just provide stable fixation, but also actively participate in and modulate the biological healing environment. It's an exciting time.